YouTube. I love it. YouTube is actually so compatible with the Seller Angels. I think that platform is going to be big someday. Uh, now we are live on Zoom, so I am thrilled to see people flooding in. Barbie Heffernan, two weeks in a row. Janet Call, Jeff and Jane Greasy, 40 plus weeks in a row. Nick Schramm, two nights in a row. Peter Glick, Scotland Kiefer, two nights in a row. Uh, this is going to be a big night. Debbie Long, Hans and Caitlin Greasy, Mark Shalinor. Mark, you are going to have to chat me up and give me the the Latin origin of Shalimar and the nationality, please. Uh, just because we're, we're big wordsmiths here at Cellar Angels. Uh, I, I like to see uh, the number of people coming in. For those of you that have sent in quite a few comments with regards to viewer mail about why does Martin wear so many gray shirts? Uh, it was always this shirt, the lavender shirt. It was just that we didn't have the appropriate lighting and had no clue on what to do with the uh, adjustments in the camera. Uh, Stephen Meyer, hello, sir. Good to see you. Jim Brubaker, back in the house. I'm so excited. We have got a humdinger for you this evening, folks, and I could not be more excited uh, because we're going to be talking about two of my favorite things in the world, Cabernet Sauvignon and Mountain Cabernet Sauvignon. So that there and of itself is a story that we're going to be unraveling this evening. And we can't do this without you, the supporters. So for those of you that were on the Wine Club dedicated only feature last night, thank you so much for joining us. That was a, a lot of fun. Leah Dunn, good to see you. Happy Friday. Uh, Julie Fogarty, back in the house. Julie, good to see you. I heard Chicago got a little bit of snow, so hopefully you're staying warm. The fire is lit and there's a glass of red wine or a bottle or two close by. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk a lot about Cabernet Sauvignon. We're going to talk a lot about mountain fruit. We're going to talk about all of you have at one point in time said to yourself, sitting on the patio at a wine tasting going, you know, this doesn't suck. I could probably do this. I, I think maybe we should start a winery. We're going to dig deep into that story of two people that actually said something similar that said, yeah, why don't we do that? And so it gives me a huge privilege to introduce to you this evening uh, tonight's featured guest, Peter Spann of Spann Vineyards, and he's going to tell us all about a variety of things, including this 2015 Cabernet Sauvignon. So Peter, thanks so much for sharing your Friday with us. Thank you very much, Martin. It's a pleasure to be here and thank all of you for joining us in a glass of wine and hopefully a very pleasant hour talking about wine. Absolutely. And if we go over, we go over. We're excited about it. Uh, you've been making wine for a long time. You're in a very, very special place, uh, but it didn't actually start in Sonoma. I don't even know where it started. You know, what, what was the, let's go like pre-Span, pre-Dallas, pre-Betsy. What was your, your kind of introduction to fermented beverages as, as a youth? Of course, you can start at 21 and older, but, in, you know, I'm sure there was nothing before 21. Oh yeah, I started, I started working with grapes when I was eight years old. Not quite old enough to drink and we didn't ferment our grapes. I grew up in a little place east of California called New Jersey. I'm not sure if anyone's familiar <laughs> with that or not. Um, uh, of course, a very famous wine growing and, and uh, you know, grape growing area, wine making area. Um, we grew Native American grapes, Concord and Catawba which are not good for winemaking. All the good grapes for winemaking come from Europe originally. We bring those grapes over to temperate climates like we have here on the West Coast and plant them in uh, nurseries, propagate them, plant our vineyards and make wine. But uh, in, the, in the Northeast where we get hard freezes in the winter, those, these grapes uh, can't survive. So we have hardy uh, Native American grapes that don't make fine wine, but they're great for juice and jelly and eating. So we had a dozen grapevines in our backyard, along with a lot of other fruit trees and bushes and things like that. So I started working with grapes, but my parents didn't make wine, didn't even drink wine. I went off to college with no- oh, Wait, so, so, so you were eight years of age and was it just like a little backyard row of vines? Yeah, actually it was a trellis. Uh, it, okay. You could walk underneath. So the vines grew up and they were trained overhead. And so we would walk underneath and clip, reach up and clip the vines. I'd have to get on a little step stool to, to reach them. Um, so they kind of grew everywhere. So it was, it was pretty to look at. Plus we had a lot of grapes because of the extensive trellising. It was almost like a trellis. 
It's about and where in, New, where in New Jersey? This was in the northeast corner of New Jersey in a little town called Closter. It was okay. uh, one town off of the Hudson River and halfway between the George Washington and the Tappanzee Bridges. Little yeah, commuter bridges town. Nice. Loaded, yeah, it was a farming town that became a commuter town for New York City. And, and how old were you when you left there? I, would, I couldn't wait to get out of New Jersey, like most people I went to high school with. <laughs> so I, I moved, went off to college in uh, New Orleans, um, totally really? different culture, a very big uh, French background, very big food and wine place, European style city. Uh, went to school with no career path in mind. And just like in this pandemic, a lot of us have had to take pivots in our life or, and maybe in our businesses. Um, and, you know, one door shuts and you got to figure out something else to do. Um, well, I, I had no clue what I was going to do in life. And I took a uh, summertime job working in a French restaurant as a waiter. And I got introduced to fine wine and fine food. And that changed my life. This so, was, so, so what I, I, first of all, New Orleans is one of my second or third favorite cities on the globe. And I'd be curious, had you ever been there prior to departing New Jersey? No. Why, why <laughs> Tulane? And, and I mean, how did you, did you throw a dart? And I mean, what, how did you pick Tulane? Or, 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 it was the only school that would take me, first of all. <laughs> but I only applied to two. I, uh, my, my father was from Alabama originally. Um, and my, uh, we would go down every three or four years, drive down to Alabama to visit his mother and relatives. And I really liked the slower pace of the South. So yep. I, I wanted to be in the South. I wanted to be at a liberal, liberal arts school where you didn't have to make any final decisions about your life for another four years till after you graduated, you know? <laughs> And that Sometimes was, even after four years, you don't have to make any decisions from yeah, those liberal arts. I never wanted to leave high school. I was perfectly happy, you know, with no responsibility and not being an adult. Um, sure. You know, I had to grow up someday. So, but also my parents uh, were married in uh, New York right after World War II and immediately got on the all night train to New Orleans uh, for their honeymoon. Uh. And my dad, when he was in college, he was a journalism major at the University of Alabama, which used to play sports against Tulane. They were in the same conference, the Southeast Conference. So he would go to New Orleans uh, on school business to cover sporting events. So he, he loved New Orleans. And well, so- I, I can't I, even imagine, the, the, I mean, first of all, New Orleans is a culture shock today, depending on where you come from, but I can't imagine what it was like for you to have grown up in New Jersey and, and then go into that environment, it had to be an explosion of, of not only uh, sounds, dialect, aromas, cuisine, all of it just had to be fantastic. Yes, and right before I left, the movie Easy Rider came out. And yep, saw, Peter and, Fonda. Yeah, and Dennis Hopper, and if, you, if you've seen that, it's about a motorcycle trip, two guys going through the South to New Orleans, and they get there in the middle of Mardi Gras, and they, they're, taking LSD and all kinds of things and the, the Mardi Gras and all those things you kind of mentioned, it's this bizarre world. And I'm going, oh my God, that's where I'm going to school. <laughs> that is fantastic. Hello to Carrie Schuster and hello to Doug Rutherford. Uh, Carrie, I saw your little snow puff ball on Instagram. No, thank you. I'll stick down in the Florida sunshine. Doug, I know you've got some snow angels up in Minnesota. Uh, so thanks for joining us both tonight. The, you mentioned that you were down in New Orleans and you decided and you got a job at a French restaurant. Right. And, and that's where the light bulb started going off with, with fine wine and cuisine. Wh which restaurant? It was, it's called Brennan's. And it's oh, yeah. a, Brennan's are a very famous restaurant family now. And Brennan's was a famous restaurant then. They only had one. Then they bought a restaurant called Commander's Palace. And then in some circles that became more famous than Brennan's. The first chef they hired at Commanders is a guy named Paul Prudhomme, which started a, left and rest, started a restaurant called K. Paul's. Um, the next guy they hired is a guy named Emeril Lagasse, who left and became the celebrity chef and started his own series of restaurants called Emeril's. So the Brennans uh, were famous family, great family to work with and launch a career from. And that's what I eventually tried to do. But uh, restaurant tours always want to sell you more stuff. 
right? You, you sit down in a restaurant, they know you're going to buy an entree, but if they can sell you a cocktail ahead of time or a bottle of wine or an appetizer or a dessert afterwards, you know, they want to sell you more stuff. So America was not a wine drinking country in the 1970s when I was waiting tables. Uh, and good wine didn't come from California. Cheap wine came from California. Good wine came from Europe. We're a French restaurant, so we have French wines on the menu. Most Americans don't speak French, can't pronounce them, don't know what the heck they mean. Americans don't drink wine or didn't at the time, but they're out for a special occasion. The one, one or two or three times a year they go to a fancy restaurant, they feel, well, maybe we should buy a bottle of wine. Well, which one? I don't know. You're going to ask this 19-year-old kid, well, he probably doesn't know anything. <laughs> so the Brennans were very sharp. They wanted to make it easy for people to buy wine. So on the menu, next to each entree, they put a wine suggestion. And so when they asked me which wine to have, I said, okay, you're having that dish. And I would just point, that wine right there. <laughs> right. Eventually, I no, had it, it, it's a, You're right. Uh, Dickie Brennan, the whole family is an amazing chain of restaurants now. Uh, Commander's Palace, very, very famous. They have, there's a Sonoma connection there as well. We've talked about it in the past because they're, their house cuvee is from Iron Horse, you know, not too far from where you are. And, and you're at, they seem to be a chef incubator over the years. Because when you have yeah. Paul Perdome and Enrol Lagasse, I mean, that's, that's not a bad pedigree to have right there in your own backyard. And so for you to have as a 19 year old kid, get an exposure to that, uh, I, I can't even imagine how exciting that was. It was more exciting than anything I was studying in college. So it's like, this is what <laughs> I want to do. You know, the heck with law school or med school or anything else. I'm going to go in the restaurant business. And um, I wanted to learn all about why different wines work with different foods. And, and people there helped teach me that. That's um, awesome. And so then I started my own restaurant, which I realized a couple of years later was a huge mistake. It's not an easy business. <laughs> so then no. I decided, well, wine's got to be easier than this. And I think I'm more interested in wine anyway. So uh, I would love to make my own wine, but hey, I barely passed high school chemistry. Maybe that's not a good idea. I might mess it up. So I went into wine marketing, importing, and sales and worked with wineries in about 20 different countries and establishing them. As America was becoming a wine drinking culture, I sort of hit it early on and I, I rode the wave, kind of like getting in on the high tech business you know, early on. It was a fabulous yep. time to get involved with wine. Well, it's, it's, I see some chats talking about the 2015 Cabernet Sauvignon. We're going to talk about that in detail in a little bit. And I want to get back to the story, but I do want to let people know that uh, Carmen Buffington to all panelists. Hey, uh, Carmen is actually in Sonoma as well. Uh, but I'll show some folks where, maybe I will, maybe I won't, uh, where you can get this wine on the Cellar Angels website. Uh, always the sip kits are flying off the shelf because people want to have something to do for the next four or five Fridays in a row. And we're going to be starting an educational series very soon, which is going to be a lot of fun. And there's actually a, a very nice gift stopper in the new sip kits. But on the left-hand side of the website, this SIP virtual tasting kit will have the next four or five Fridays in a row so that you can sit back and relax with fine ladies and gentlemen like Peter, learn the story of the wine, learn the story of the people making the wine. This is Peter's wine right here. It's a 2015 Cabernet Sauvignon. We're gonna talk all about the Mayakama Mountain Range and you're gonna learn a heck of a lot about dirt, water and mountains more than you ever thought you would know. And by the way, you can spend 80, 90, 100, $110 a bottle on a Cabernet, but at $40, when it tastes damn near identical, you don't have to. And, and that's what one of the things we do at Cellar Angels is we help find these wines. So you can sit back, relax by the fire, uh, enjoy some great company, some great wine. And it's, it's a steal at that price. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking to good friend Diana Schweiger and Acumen, but this is where you go to get this wine, and we're going to uh, spend some time with Peter talking about the entire portfolio, refreshing the 2015 cab. Uh, 2015, kind of a blockbuster year with regards to yield. It's, everything seemed to be going right that time or that year, and, and the 2015 is a long way away from you starting a restaurant. Did you start it in New Orleans? Yes, I did. So did you? A little bit of competition there. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. I mean, I would have started small with like maybe a food truck, but you decided to go with the restaurant. And yep. did was there a, a theme? Sushi? 
No, no, we were uh, continentals, European style food um, with a little bit of a New Orleans twist to it, but mainly French style, old style. Okay, perfect. Uh, what was your, I, I, every time I go to New Orleans and I've been there for probably uh, two dozen medical conferences over the last 20 years or more. And every time I go there, I have a unique experience. And every time I go there, I, I fall more and more in love with the city and the people. And, and you know, you get out of the French Quarter and it's the people that just really, that, that vibe is just, you, you take a piece of it home with you. For you, what did you, what did you depart New Orleans with after your time there? Well, they, uh, they, there's something in New Orleans uh, referred to as joie de vivre which is French for a joy of life. Mm -hmm. It's just being happy that, you know, don't take things too seriously, you know, let things slide off your back, just enjoy life. And that's what I really learned from New Orleans, that general feeling. Yeah, that's a, it's a great philosophy. And it's certain, certainly that you can carry forward to today because obviously where you are in wine country, the last several years have had their share of, uh, character building moments, if you will, where Mother Nature or anybody else has tried to test the mettle of, of the folks that are producing wine there. So you leave New Orleans and, and then what happens? Well, I, I, in New Orleans, when I closed down the restaurant, I started a wine marketing and sales business, uh, working with new upstart California wineries who were in the incubation sort of stages, wineries that you may have heard of called Camus Vineyards or Fetzer Vineyards. Nivon what, what year are we talking about, Peter? This was 1978. Okay. So like Camus started in 1972, a tiny little winery. No one had ever heard of it. Uh, they didn't have a sale, national sales force. Um, so I started what's called a brokerage business where I uh, lined up wineries that I felt had a lot of potential and made great wines. And I said, well, I live in New Orleans. I can introduce you to distributors in Louisiana and Texas and Oklahoma and Arkansas and go out with their sales force and introduce your wines to restaurants and retail stores and so on and help you build the market for your brand because you don't have the money to do that. And so I, uh, at this point, I'd learned a lot about wine and knew what I liked and picked some wineries that became extremely successful, not because of me, but because they made great wine and they hired other people that helped make them successful. So you kind of created um, a market with regards to the distribution channel that wasn't there before. Right. Right. Yeah. So Very a lot nice. of in the in the seventies, there were uh, young uh, people moving to California, saying better wine can be made here than this stuff in the jug that you're naming after European wine regions and not trying to be serious about. And then there were some homegrown people like the Wagner family from Camus that, grew, that had lived in Napa for two generations at that point um, that said, we need to make something better out of our vineyard than just selling it to these bulk wineries and then making cheap wine out of it. We can, we're growing good grapes, we, we can make better wine. And so that was all just starting. And so it was a very exciting time to be in the business and discover all these small gems of wineries and go out and teach other people about them. It was very exciting for me. That, and did you, be, in addition to Camus, and hello, Nelson and Liz, uh, thanks for joining. In addition to Camus and, and Fetzer, I think you mentioned, did you, it was kind of had to be the wild, wild west in New Orleans because you could just basically carry whatever winery you wanted. It wasn't as if, I mean, it was your own company. It wasn't as if you were beholden to uh, a certain book of business. If you liked the winery, you could rep them in that region, correct? Correct. Well, as long as they wanted me, you know, we had to have a meeting of the minds. Right. And at that time, since people were drinking French wine, that's what retailers were selling, French and German and Italian and so on. And I would go to them with a bottle of California Cabernet Sauvignon and they would say, what's that? I said, well, Cabernet Sauvignon is a grape variety and it's one of the main grapes that goes into the red Bordeaux that you're selling. And they would say, well, why don't they call it Bordeaux? I'm like, well, they don't want to do that. <laughs> they've, right. been, they've been doing that. And, you know, they're not, they don't want to mimic other people anymore. They want to make their own name. So you got to get used to these great fries. And we'd say, you know, and now I go to people and I try to sell them Bordeaux and they say, what's Bordeaux? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. It's gone full circle. You know? Yeah, absolutely. So it was, it was, it was a crazy time. So being able to introduce people to new things was a lot of fun. 
No, that that's very cool. And uh, Jeff and Jane are commenting in the chat. It's like, hey, it sounds a lot like Martin and Denise that are creating a market for wines, bringing people together. And uh, we were 50 years behind you, unfortunately. So uh, I, I like your, your thinking style. First of all, and I also applaud the entrepreneurial spirit. And I don't know if that's from growing uh, terrible grapes as an eight-year-old and cultivating that or just basically embracing the, 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 the passion and, and kind of the, the energy of New Orleans. But you started a restaurant, you started a business, and, and you created a market where, where one didn't exist just from a pure passion of wine and food. So I, my hat's off to you in that capacity. Walk us through the, the movement West. Okay. How did the New Jersey gentleman decide, hey, California seems like an okay place that they're producing some good wines? Yeah, and uh, but just a little bit of backstory. Um, so since I started out on European wines, um, a lot of people don't realize that uh, you know, there's no such thing as 100% Cabernet Sauvignon from Bordeaux, the region Cabernet Sauvignon was born in and comes from. In Bordeaux, every red wine is a blend and there's reasons for that. In California now, we, a lot of people are focused on single grape varieties. But if you look at the back label of the My Camus Cabernet Sauvignon that you have, you'll notice it has four different grape varieties in it. And that, so this is a Bordeaux style blend. It has Cabernet Sauvignon, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. These four grapes are four out of the six legal grapes, to, grapes that are legal to be put into a wine that says Bordeaux on the label. Um, they have kind of zoning laws in Europe, which we don't have in California. In each region, uh, they say, well, the best thing to do is make wine out of the grapes from our region. There's no law in Bordeaux that says you have to blend, but it's what makes the best wine. And I'll go into a little bit more of that later. But if, if, you, if anyone is tasting this wine and saying, well, this is not as heavy as some Cabernet Sauvignons I've had, that's because it's a blend. Because different grape varieties go to different parts of your mouth. Cabernet Sauvignon tends to go focus all its flavor on the back half of your tongue. It's all the flavor to one spot, it feels heavy. Caber uh, this has Cabernet Franc in it, which covers your whole tongue. So it pulls the flavors forward. Merlot does something similar. Petit Verdot goes to the roof of your mouth. So now we're sending the flavors out in all directions. So we wanna make wine that has a lot of flavor, but not more flavor than weight. And also Cabernet Sauvignon is high in something called tannin, which dries your saliva up and puckers your mouth up. You notice this wine doesn't display a whole lot of that at all. That's another reason for blending because Merlot and Cabernet Franc and Petit Verdot don't express tannin. They have tannin, but it's so low that you don't notice it. So it covers over the tannin of the Cabernet Sauvignon and makes a smoother wine. Well, so, you, one thing you mentioned actually has uh, caused me to be a, a bit more inquisitive than normal. You mentioned that this wine has four of the six Bordeaux traditional grapes. And I know the one that's missing on the back of the label, because I always thought there was five, is Malbec. What is the six? The six was added about five years ago, added back in, it's called Carmenere, which some people wow. may, may know from Chile, um, about 90% of all the Carmenere in the world is now grown at Chile. Right. It, was, it was kicked out of Bordeaux back in the late 1800s because it wasn't getting ripe, but it was, it was born there. It's a half brother of Cabernet Sauvignon and a half brother of Merlot also. All three have a common parent. Their common parent is Cabernet Franc. It was the original Bordeaux grape, um, but it begat several other grapes. So Carmenere needs a longer growing season. It got kicked out. They, they brought some vines into Chile where it was planted in warmer regions. It got ripe, it worked well. With climate change, they allowed it back into Bordeaux because now it can get fully ripe. So, so now there's six, but most people still think the way you do that there's five. But there's right. only like five acres of Carmenere in all of Bordeaux, so it's almost non-existent. Uh, team meeting on Monday, I would like to know who omitted Carmenere from the discussion. Thank you. <laughs> I just have to. The interns are not pulling their weight, so we're going to have a discussion on how we missed Carmenere since it's been available for five years. It's one of the six Porto varieties. Yeah, but it's always uh, been like there's only about five acres or ten acres, so it's it's like there's not a lot yet. But no, and, you, and you're, you're right. We used to care when we owned the wine shop. We it was always from South America, and it, it's. I'd be curious what it tastes like from a flavor profile in Bordeaux because in in South America. On its own, you know, as a single varietal bottle, it, it, there, you had to really search high and low to find one that wasn't overly vegetal or green pepper 
type of component. And, and for m- much of the American palate, that seems to be very off-putting and, and understandably so, but I would imagine in, in small amounts, it, it can be very, very useful from a blending perspective. But at the end of the day, I'd be curious what that, what that five acres or hectares in Bordeaux is producing from well, a flavor profile. The green peppercorn aromas you get out of Carmenere is when the grapes are underripe. And that's why it was kicked to the Bordeaux. So uh, when when they planted it in Chile, they didn't realize it was Carmenere. They thought it was Merlot. And so they would, and Merlot is an early ripening grape. So they would pick it early with with the rest of the Merlot. And so that's why we were getting green peppercorn Carmenere. But now that they've done DNA testing and separated out what is Carmenere and what is Merlot, the Carmenere is from Chile. They're letting them get riper and they're making much better wine now. So in Bordeaux, it's being planted only in the warmer parts, which is over right. in Saint Emilion on what's called the right bank. So you grow Malbec, but you did not decide to put any in the fifteen. Correct. Tell, please tell why. Um, every year we we make wine from five out of the six Bordeaux grapes, and we do blending trials. So when we first make uh, wine from Malbec. We don't say, okay, this is definitely going to go in our Mayakamas Range Cabernet from this vintage. We say this is a potential component for that wine. And so then we we age the wines in barrel uh, separately. And then we start looking at our blends. We make like 22 different wines. We make an individual Malbec. Uh, We make a few other wines that we add Malbec to. So we have different opportunities for Malbec. So we start, uh, but we want each wine to taste distinctly different. So we start uh, doing our you know, tasting through the barrels and doing blending trials. And uh, so we decide this Cabernet Sauvignon is one of our flagship wines. Um, so we make that one of the first wines. And then if the Malbec doesn't work in it, well, it goes into something else, but it has the first option is to go into this wine. Malbec is very similar to Merlot. They, these are half brothers also. Merlot tastes like red cherry. Malbec is more like black cherry. Um, neither one show tannin. Malbec's a little bit richer than Merlot. So they, they are almost interchangeable, not exactly, but uh, in, in our uh, case, they can be. So uh, it just, it didn't work out so well in the blend. This, this blend worked out better. So that's what we did. I, would, I would, would fathom the guess that you make 22 different wines sounds like a focus problem. <laughs> Well, it's because I've been selling wine for 50 years and I got tired of Chardonnay like 40 years ago. And uh, <laughs> no, more, that's awesome. Yeah. So in, your, in, this European, ahead, I'm sorry. in this European grape family, there's 10,000 different grapes that make good wine. And so there's so much opportunity, so many interesting things. You know, why stick with the same thing over and over again? No, it's, I mean, you're right. You've got an open canvas. It's like a bully base. You can just make as much and, and varied as you want. And each time you get to sample it and blend and create something different based upon the ingredients that Mother Nature provided you this year. So uh, I do want to uh, show people where this vineyard behind me is located. And, and, and I've, I've traversed and crisscrossed Napa and Sonoma counties uh, a lot of times. And there are a few vineyards that for the life of me, I don't know how they made these vineyards. I don't know how the equipment got to these locations. For those of you that are golfers and have ever played golf in in the old country, in Ireland or Scotland, uh, or even driven over there, some of the roads are like cart paths in the United States. I can tell you that trying to find Peter and Betsy's location many years ago when we were uh, filming, it was white knuckled, it would be an understatement to a degree, but it is remote, but yet also in the center of everything. And, and I'll show you a little bit about what I'm talking about because you're not gonna, I would imagine Peter, when, when, if anybody knocked on the door, they were either really lost or they were invited guests and nowhere in between. You know, the Jehovah's Witnesses would find us. <laughs> or twice a year. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So let's take a look about where we're talking about in the Maya Cayman range uh, as it relates to span vineyards. So you all know our focus of wine region is Napa and Sonoma. And if you are new to Cellar Angels, this is the only region we focus on in the world. 
is finding some of the greatest wines that will never be on a wine store shelf, rarely on a restaurant list that you just can't get. Uh, we wanna make those available to you. So we focus on Napa and Sonoma exclusively. So this is wine region to us. And, and we talk about the, the, the typicity of this region the maritime influence of the region, the geological structures in the region. And we're gonna talk about the Maya Kama mountain range specifically, because when you look at what is dividing Napa and Sonoma other than this county line, it's this mountain range right here. Uh, and this is the Maya Kama mountain range. And so this is a range that has not only the geological substance of just miraculous components and soil types and structures and volcanic and uplift, and, and erosion components over millions of years, but it also has a huge maritime influence with the number of creeks and rivers that actually flow through the range. And we'll get to that a little bit later because it's a poll question. Uh, but when you are looking at where Span Vineyards is in the Mayacamas, you have to go deep into the woods and you might hear banjos. You might have, you know, we talked Peter Fonda, let, well, let's talk deliverance because this is, this is in, the, in the woods. Now, this doesn't look crazy remote or, or crazy distant or crazy mountainous. But if you look at this terraced hillside vineyard right here, and then I zoom in a little bit, you begin to see and watch the mountain take shape and how this vineyard is on a ledge in a bowl on the, on the side of the mountain. And the Peter's house and Betsy's house is right here. So the, the backside of their house on this 40 acre property was this beautiful vineyard site. And, and, and Peter, I think you've actually got a, a better slideshow that, mm -hmm. that will tell the story and answer a lot of questions so that if you think you wanna get into the wine business and you wanna start a winery, Peter has the story of how he and Betsy did it and where they are today. Okay, we'll jump into that. So if all of you think about the map of the world that Martin just showed, and when he zoomed in on Napa and Sonoma, you saw the county line going right down the ridge of the Mayacamas Mountains. And you saw the ocean off to the left, to the west. That's where the cold air comes from. The valley, the, that sea level, obviously, the valley floor in Sonoma Valley is 300 feet. Our vineyard is roughly 2,000 feet. The top of the mountains are about 2,200. That 1,700 feet of elevation keeps some of the cold air on the Sonoma side. So we say we are so much cooler than Napa in every way. <laughs> um, but we are more of a European climate because we're trapping the cold air. We're uh, latitude wise, we're much closer to the equator or considerably closer to the equator than Bordeaux is. So we have more warmth, longer growing season. So we make it more European by being on the colder side of the mountain. So we chose the Sonoma side for the cooler air. So um, Betsy and I lived in Dallas, Texas, where we had our wine marketing and sales business. And, and by the way, just so everyone knows, every wine story of, of this dedication is in fact a, a love story. So living in Dallas, go ahead, Peter, I'll let you take it away. We had a five bedroom, four bath house in Dallas looking over a beautiful creek and we sold it. And for twice what we sold it for, we were able to acquire this mansion in Sonoma Valley. <laughs> this, this hobbit hole, hovel, um, A-frame cabin, but this was obviously not the uh, main point of buying the vineyard. These trees you see in front of it was part of it. We, um, this is 41 acres of redwood forest. We had 120 foot tall trees growing through our front deck and all around our house. Absolutely beautiful property but the real beauty was the vineyard at the back end. So this I think gives you more a sense of the steepness um, that Martin was describing. Um, and down at the, at the bottom of the vineyard there is, is my wife, Betsy. Um, we believe strongly in organic farming and biodynamic farming. So we have a biodynamic cover crop in our vineyard, uh, special uh, plants uh, that uh, put back into the soil what the vines take out. So it keeps everything in balance. So we don't need any fertilizers. We don't use any chemicals or pesticides. Um, we, we farm very naturally. Um, and our, we moved out there for me to run a wine importing company based in San Francisco. Uh, we couldn't afford a house in San Francisco, but we could afford our 41 acres in the mountains. 
Uh, so the idea was by buying this vineyard, we could make a little bit of homemade wine. Betsy, by the way, had made wine in a previous life. Um, so she already knew how to make wine, but mainly we're, she was gonna grow the grapes and sell the grapes to uh, a, a nearby winery. We didn't know who yet, but two thirds of all the vineyard land in Sonoma County is owned by independent farmers who sell and supply wineries with their grapes. But we uh, took over the vineyard in 2001 uh, right before the dot-com bust and 9-11. And so we went into a recession. People stopped traveling because of 9-11. And so the wine business, the bottom fell out of it. And so wineries all of a sudden had more grapes than they knew what to do with. And we were going around knocking on doors and getting doors slammed in our face. So we said, okay, Betsy, you know how to make wine. I know how to sell wine. I've got customers all over the country. We're going to make wine. And so if you see that deck in the uh, left-hand side of the slide, that became our winery. Um, this canvas carport, we went to Costco and bought that for $299. Uh, the redwood deck was free because the uh, previous owners of the property had cleared these, this two and a half acres of redwood trees, brought a portable mill up, milled the uh, trees into 20 foot long two by eights. And we said, okay, we got free wood, we can, we can build a winery. Um, so we actually did our first year, we did four years of crush right there in that little cannabis carport. But wow. we said, we, really, we need to build a real winery. So we started building a structure down by our house. And in Sonoma Valley, there's a couple of classic, like 120 year old winery buildings that are now defunct, but they're natural stone on the bottom and Borden Batten Redwood on the top. And so we, I knew from my marketing experience that in the wine business, it pays to look like you've been around for a while because people think you know what you're doing. So we built a, we found faux stone facing on some cinder blocks, built the bottom part out of that. Uh, we got some plywood and stained it to look like redwood. We cut some strips out of the, the boards up in the vineyard, nailed them on the front to make it look like board and batten redwood, uh, hired a carpenter to mill down some of the redwood into these gorgeous doors for us. And my wife said, we need some color on the building. So she went out and got some planter boxes, window boxes, put some geraniums in them. And we had our beautiful classic old winery. Look, looks like we've been around for a hundred years. It, it, it may shock both you and Betsy right now that this entire build your own winery kit is available at Ikea. Yeah. Weird. <laughs> that so, looks incredible. Yeah. And so the whole time, you know, this was, this was the fourth year we were making wine. We still hadn't had a paycheck. So I had to keep my day job running the importing company in San Francisco for the first seven years before we could take a paycheck because we were everything we brought in from selling wine, we had to reinvest in stone or wood or equipment or grapes or barrels or something else. Right. And when we looked at the harvest records from the previous owners, it showed that the first two years they had zero crop and they had a footnote lost to birds. So we said, what's that all about? And they said, well, you share the forest with birds. They like to eat fruit. When your grapes start turning purple, which we call Verasian, grapes turn from green to purple, they notice that change and they're gonna come down and start pecking at those grapes. So you have to put bird netting over all your rows and we're going, oh boy, lots of fun. So we have these uh, plastic cups turned upside down. That's to protect the bird netting from the posts, put poking holes in it. But if you see in the lower left-hand corner of the slide, the bird netting on the ground there, we also have to get down on our hands and knees, pull the bird netting in from each side, uh, use a twist tie to tie it together underneath the irrigation hose to keep the raccoons out from underneath because they want to steal the grapes too. Everybody wants to steal our crop. And uh, since Betsy had grown up in Northern California and I was, had been in the wine business a long time, we had a lot of friends here and family and they kept calling us saying, when are you going to invite us up to see your new property and your vineyard and all that? So we waited to the middle of October because we know that's harvest time. We said, well, now's a good time to come. Oh, by the way, you can help us pick grapes. <laughs> we had our free picking crew. So I'd, I'd go ahead of them, undo the twist ties, pull up the bird netting. They'd go through, pick grapes into these yellow boxes. Um, these hold about 35 pounds of Cabernet Sauvignon grapes. That's Betsy coming down a vineyard row. And then we put them in the back of our John Deere Gator and bring them down to the winery. And if you notice in the lower left-hand box here, in the very center of the box, there's a small green grape that's about a quarter the size of the purple grapes. 
And so it's underripe fruit. It never developed fully. It didn't, the flower didn't get um, uh, fertilized properly. And so that's gonna be very tart. And we don't want that in our wine. So the latest technology at the time was something called the sorting table, which is a way of getting all the, the unwanted stuff out of your fermentation bin or not keep it from going into the fermentation bin. So you, you dump the grapes in through this uh, machine. It uh, takes the grapes off of the stems and put, lays them out on a metal conveyor belt that has holes in it that are just slightly smaller than the ideal size of the grape you're picking. So all the undersized stuff falls through and goes away. Um, but we couldn't afford that technology. We, we could barely afford to build this building. And so we had these friends. We said, okay, we're gonna have the manual sorting table. So you guys thought you were done when you finished picking the grapes. Now you gotta sort them. So they would go through and pull out the undersized berries, the dead lizards, the hawk feathers, the leaves, anything we don't want in there. Uh, and then they'd hand me the cleaned box of grapes and I would dump it down through our Tinker Toy Crusher. Um, a good big winery would have one about 30 times the size of this. Uh, but this has two rollers inside of it and the grapes fall through the rollers and get squeezed, fall down through the bottom. The skins are broken. So the pulp starts separating from the skin. And oxygen is a friend and a foe to wine. A little bit of it helps uh, change the molecular structure and the chemistry of the liquid to develop aromas and flavors, all that boring stuff. But too much of it will make wine go over the hill. You've probably all left a bottle open overnight and then the next day you taste it and it's not quite as good as it was. That's because it's over oxygenated. So uh, as we're crushing the grapes, a big winery once again would pump all of this into a stainless steel tank and then they would hook up a CO2 hose to the top, blow out the air, which has oxygen in it, blanket the wine with CO2 to keep oxygen away from it, to preserve it. Small wineries like us have to be innovative. So we go to the grocery store and get blocks of dry ice, which is frozen CO2. We put that in and it melts and you get this great thing going on. Looks like you're having a Halloween party or a, maybe doing a scene from Macbeth. Um, and then we have to cover this over with a sheet of plastic to hold the CO2 in to preserve the wine. Uh, that will last for about three days. But as it's in there, it start, the juice starts warming up. And as the juice warms up, the natural yeast on the skins of the grapes awakens up, says, hey, we're hungry, let's eat some sugar. So it starts eating the natural sugar in the juice and turns that into alcohol and CO2. So now we're creating our own CO2. I don't yeah. know if this is actually a picture from the winery or if this is just you in college at Tulane. <laughs> this is in the winery. <laughs> This is one of the one of the fun things is dumping in the uh, dry ice. Yep. And so as the CO2 is created, it pushes the skins up to the top. So it forms what we call a cap, which is about three inches thick. And the skins keep the air away from the juice. So once again, we're preserving the, the, the juice. But all the color, most of the flavor and most of the aroma comes from the skins. So you've got to mix the skins with the juice a few times a day. So I'm doing something called a punch down. I have this rod with a pl plastic plate at the bottom of it. And I work my way around the bin, pushing the grapes down uh, to mix it with the juice and it pops back up. In the old days, they would do this by foot treading. And at the importing company, we handled some wines from the Douro Valley of Portugal. And one of our small wineries set, told me that they still foot, trod, foot tread the grapes. I asked him why. And he said, well, we're in a mountainous region. We get a lot of tannin in our, the skins. We wanna make smooth wine, so we find we get a smoother release of tannin out of the skins when we foot tread. So I said, cool, we can do that. So here's Betsy and a friend doing the foot treading. And this is a great way to get people to come and pick grapes for you. You tell them you can get in the bin afterward and foot tread and they say, oh boy, let's do that. But it is hard work because you gotta lift your leg way up to get above the cap and then push down against the skins, push them all the way down to the bottom so you notice the, the woman on the left, she starts in one corner. She's going to walk slowly forward to the other side, move over about six inches, walk slowly backwards, move over six inches and so on. So this is tiring. We got a lot of bins to do. So you got to take a break, you know, have a glass of wine, enjoy what you're doing. And if you happen to bring along a clean white t-shirt, you can step out of the bin and you, you know, get some uh, nice 
uh, souvenir of the day when you stain the t-shirt instead of your feet. But as the uh, yeast finishes eating all the sugar, the production of CO2 stops and this, the cap starts falling down into the juice. Once again, we have to worry about oxidation. So at that point, we get out our three gallon red buckets and bucket the juice and skins into our press. This is what's called a, a bladder basket press. There's a metal rod coming up through the middle of it that has a rubber bladder around it, kind of like an inner tube. And so the guy with the blue hands is gonna pull down that white top, go over that threaded steel rod, uh, put a wing nut over the, the threaded uh, rod to secure it down. Then we'll hook a water hose up to the bladder, turn on the water, and we get a very gentle press against the skins. So once again, to, to gently release the tannins and not get any harshness to make as smooth a wine as possible. So the juice flows out. My brother catches it in uh, one of our empty red buckets now. And you notice the empty bucket right above it, there's the orange on off handle for the hose. Yep. Above that is a pressure meter. We don't let the pressure get too high because then we're, we'll start squeezing astringency out of the skins. So we have our threshold, as soon as it hits that, we shut off the water. We let some juice trickle out, the pressure goes down, we turn the water back on. So we press it like eight or nine times to gently each time to get as much juice out as possible without any harshness. And then he'll hand the full bucket up to Betsy, slide the empty one underneath the trough. Betsy pours the, the wine through the funnel down into the barrel. And you notice the press here has the wing nut securely fastened on top of it. Well, in our first vintage, she didn't get the wing nut on quite tight enough. The top popped off, the grapes went everywhere, messed up our brand new carport, um, even got all over her face. This by the way, was her very first ever selfie in life. Um, and uh, at this point, you know, stuff happens when you're starting a business uh, you just say, okay, let's call it a day. Let's clean everything up. Let's get out a bottle of bubbly. Let's get out the sword, saber off the top of it, pour a glass for our friends, get out some food. And so this is what wine is really all about. Good wine with good food and good friends. It's the joie de vie that you were talking about earlier. Stuff's going to happen. Yeah. Don't let it bother you. Don't let it bother you. Uh, quick question on the dry ice. Does is there a risk that that actually can freeze the grapes? No, no. No, dry ice okay. is very deceptive. It doesn't actually put out much cooling very far away from it. And it, you know, as, as soon as it, when it hits the ice, it, it melts and turns to gas. So it, it's no longer that cold. Because actually we, we wanna eventually warm up the, the juice. So sitting, we pick the juice, pick the grapes at about 42 degrees out in the vineyard, goes in the winery, and it gradually starts warming up because yeast won't become active until it gets us to a certain temperature. Peter, I'm going to ask a poll question. And in the interim, you can actually work on lighting because you went into the witness protection program <laughs> there for a second. Yeah. Uh, so that was outstanding. And there's a couple of folks that have ba basically were inquiring and whether or not you were applying for people to come as vineyard workers, but we'll, we'll let them know that they can take applications to get in line. Uh, but that was wonderful. So uh, I do want to ask a, a first question. You know, we haven't talked a lot about Betsy, but you did reference Betsy in the video. And we all got to, or I'm sorry, in the slideshow, we all got to see uh, her and, and learn that she, in fact, uh, has a experience in history and winemaking. But I do want to let folks know, uh, if you've been paying attention, Peter and Betsy have benefited greatly from their winemaking education via the DeVry Institute of Technology remote learning class. You've seen that online. Uh, they were self-taught. They attended Le Cordon Bleu in Paris, or in fact, they went through and matriculated via the New England Culinary School in Montpellier. So any one of these uh, DeVry not getting a lot of love, which I find surprising because they have a robust online course for wine, remote winemaking. Uh, we are going to, uh, and by the way, if anybody's affiliated with DeVry, my apologies in advance, send all the emails to Denise. Uh, we'll give this five more seconds, four, three, two, one. So we have, interesting, 
Um, the majority said self-taught. So uh, what is the correct answer? Cordon Bleu or New England Culinary School? Well, I'm actually going on the internet right now and applying for admission to DeVry University so I can learn how to make wine. <laughs> no, totally yeah. self-taught. Totally self-taught. Yeah. So I want to see via the chat line who had self-taught, honest answers only, because uh, that will weigh into this second, their second question. Um, so self-taught winemaking, I mean, we talked about the entrepreneurialism of starting multiple businesses. How do you go about saying, hey, we can make wine? Well, uh, self-taught is being a little ingenuous. Uh, since I had like 40 years of working with other wineries before we started ours, I learned a tremendous amount from other people. And I, I did intern at two wineries in Napa Valley uh, before we started ours, just because I wanted to learn more about wine uh, when I was marketing for those wineries. And the, uh, but- Sorry. Go back to the question, chemistry, study chemistry um, is the most important basis. And that's what Betsy did. So once you know chemistry, you can get a winemaking textbook from UC Davis or anybody and, and read about winemaking. If you know how to make beer, you know how to make wine. Um, the course actually at Davis is, is, does, is not winemaking, it is fermentation sciences. So mm -hmm. it's about, you know, so, People that want to start a brewery or a winery, they all start working at the same basic courses. And then you right. specialize after that. But uh, the most important thing I, I learned was from a winery, uh, Pine Ridge Winery, the owner was trained in Bordeaux. And exactly. when, yep. in France, it's not about school. It's about, you know, what, what grandpa taught, taught, taught my father and what I'm going to teach you. You know, it's, they go through generations and generations of owner winemakers. So he learned from someone like that. And this thing I, t I mentioned earlier about where different grapes go in your mouth, I learned from him and he learned it in Bordeaux. And I mentioned this to other winemakers in California and they're like, what? I never heard of that. They didn't teach us that in school. And no, that's, that's old school. So we right. were, I'm sort of old school. Betsy is a little bit new school because she understands chemistry, but I'm not going to try to figure that out. No, uh, I had chemistry in college and it was, wasn't that many classes. And so I'll leave the chemistry to Betsy. The, so when people and the travel restrictions get lifted, and I understand there's a slow rollback right now in California, which is fantastic. And, and we all get to travel and people that are in the Bay Area that are now going to be migrating up to wine country, where can they taste these wines? At our tasting room in Kenwood. Um, Kenwood is halfway between Sonoma and uh, Santa Rosa, if you're familiar with those places. There's a um, highway called Highway 12 that runs between the two. Uh, if you're familiar with Highway 101, which goes from San Francisco up to Santa Rosa, Highway 12 is off to the east, runs almost parallel to it. There, This is Winery Row. There's probably, when I first visited Sonoma Valley in 1976, there were maybe four or five wineries between the city of Sonoma and Santa Rosa. And now there's about four or five in every block. Um, there's maybe 50 right along this highway. So it's a fabulous place to go wine tasting. You can actually come and park in our parking lot and without moving your car, you can walk around and taste at five different tasting rooms. So it's very simple. That is not a bug, that's a feature. So I, I think that is actually, you might see a, a lot of cars in your parking lot and, and maybe people not in the taste room might wonder, where are all these people? Yeah. So um, our taste room is reopening this Sunday. We just, California just reopened. Uh, we're outdoor tasting only. Um, so if it's pouring down rain, you probably don't wanna go out wine tasting. Um, but in Sonoma, we, rain stops in April and doesn't start again until November. So we have a, a nice big long season when it's great to go wine tasting. And for those of you that got the first poll question correct, I mean, everyone can play, but I, I really wanna see if the, if the winners can keep winning. So the second poll question, we talked about the Mayacamas mountain range and, and we often talk in, at Cellar Angels about kind of the geological formations, the soil structure, the subsoil types, all of that. But water plays a very pivotal role. And Peter actually talked about the maritime influence of the Pacific Ocean. 
But fun fact, uh, the Maya Cayman is actually is home to both numerous geological traits, but also how many streams? One, the Russian River, two streams, six streams, nine streams, or 11 streams. So for those of you that are up on your hydro influence on winemaking, this is your time. And for extra credit, I'm going to ask you to name them. <clears throat> it's interesting because we, we marvel at just how, how amazing this landscape is for wine production. And we often talk about, you know, the volcanic clay, loam, sand, uh, flint, shale, all of, the, all of the geology, but we also don't talk about the, the water influence. So five, four, three, two, one. I'm guessing there was some smartphone, <laughs> some smart home assistance here because way too many people got six streams correct. And uh, that, is, that is actually correct. There are six streams in the Mayakima mountain range. Mark West, Calabasas, Arroyo Seco. Every, which, which mountain range doesn't have a stream called Arroyo Seco? Uh, but the Mayakamas is actually an Indi Indian of origin. So of course you're gonna have a stream called the Punta, the Santa Rosa and the Sonoma stream. There's your six streams right there all influencing the vineyards and all of them important with regards to the agriculture, the climate, the microclimate of a gorgeous section of land behind me. Uh, I the, think, go ahead, the, Peter. Sonoma, one of the sources for Sonoma Creek is on our property. Just below where the carport winery was is a spring. The water just springs up out of the ground, which to me is absolutely amazing. Flows down the mountainside and there are several other springs near us and they all come together and, and form Sonoma Creek. That is awesome. So in, in the closing minutes, I want you to, to tell me about the 2015. And then also you mentioned earlier that you make 22 different wines. Uh, what, what, what is the 2015? Talk to me about the growing season. Talk to me about actually um, why it's special and why you make this wine. It's special because we didn't have a wildfire. <laughs> um, no, what makes a special year in 2015 was one of those, we didn't have extremes. We didn't have extreme heat. We didn't have ex extreme cool. Uh, grapes only ripen within a certain bandwidth of temperature, um, plus a certain bandwidth of sunshine. So Sorry, sunshine, it's a, it's the Mike Pence fly is all over the place tonight. I don't know what that is. So sunshine um, coming down on the leaves, creating photosynthesis that creates the food for the plant is very important. If you get a lot of overcast skies, you don't get quite as much uh, photosynthesis happening. You don't get the right amount of ripeness. There's three things we look at when we get ready to pick grapes. We look at sugar level, acidity, and pH, and they have to be in balance. And if you get like a week of 105 degree afternoons, the sugar will spike and go way up the acid won't fall as quickly. It just keeps clicking away like it's not bothered. And we need the pH to come up along with the sugar and it does the same thing as acid. It just clicks away and doesn't get bothered by heat. So uh, we didn't have that happen. So everything fell uh, with it right in balance to make perfectly balanced wine. Yeah, I know and it, and it is perfectly balanced. And a number of folks have actually commented with regards to how balanced it is. And, and I appreciated early on your description of flavor versus tannin and flavor versus weight, uh, which uh, is very apropos. And I, I think the Brennans would be proud because you have shown quite admirably uh, what you learned and now is on display at the vineyard. So we are humbled to be able to feature this wine at Cellar Angels. Well, thank you for doing so. Thank you for having uh, me meet all your guests. No, and, and I do want to, uh, in the closing moments here, it is the, uh, yes, she's aware of it. Uh, we're going to sing Denise happy birthday, you and I, Peter. So the chief operating angel, I mean, we can't do this without our supporters, all of which are in the attendees. And there she is from, from the booth up above. And, and yes, Jeff, you do listen well. So I want to sing happy birthday to Denise. So happy birthday to you. 
Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Denise. We can't do this without you. Cheers. Uh, it is a fantastic birthday. Uh, 40 never looked so good. But this wine is tasting amazing. Uh, Denise, do you have a few words you'd like to say? I'm 30. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I lied. Uh, uh, she is 30. It's her 20th anniversary of her 30th birthday. Actually, it might be a little bit more than that. But I do want to, uh, the portfolio has 22 wines. You can taste them all at the tasting room in uh, Glen Ellen. And by the way, if you haven't been to Glen Ellen, it's a little slice of heaven. And I encourage people to drive up uh, that little road because there are a bunch of wineries off that road. And it is as idyllic as wine country gets. You will probably never find this vineyard. And if you ever get a chance to visit Peter and Betsy, watch the Cellar Angels video because you'll see exactly how remote it was when we filmed quite a few years ago. But just magical place producing magical wine. And as you can see from very, very magical people. Peter, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I know Betsy's off camera, so give our love and appreciation to her. This has been a, a wonderful evening and thank you for the slideshow because that really paints a very, very interesting, intricate picture of, for those of us that want to do this, maybe we'll let folks like Peter and Betsy do it and their friends. Or if you want to come talk to us first and we'll talk you out of it. <laughs> <laughs> this has been a Absolutely. Being able to create something and something that other people can enjoy has been a, a fabulous experience. So I wouldn't trade it for the world. Outstanding. Uh, well, we're looking forward to California reopening. Everyone else, stay warm, stay safe, take care of one another, be good to one another, and thanks so much, you guys. Cheers. Can't do this without.